When it came to the Beatles, I was a late bloomer. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was 1977. I was 11 years old. And my favorite television show, my favorite morning show, The New Zoo Review, had been suddenly and unforgivably preempted. I won't mince words. I love The New Zoo Review. With its fanciful depictions of life-size animal puppets living in perfect utopian harmony with their human counterparts. What's not to love? <laughs> Henrietta Hippo was a hoot, and Freddy the Frog was, uh, was hilarious. But on that fateful morning, as I took another bite of sugared cereal, it was 1977, it was all sugared cereal. As I took another bite of sugared cereal, the New Zoo Review had been replaced by, of all things, the Beatles. And I had absolutely no idea who they were. At first, I was more than a little perturbed by their appearance in my life. Who were these cartoon guys? But then just as suddenly, I was smitten with the four lads from Liverpool. They got in great adventures. They had hilarious hijinks. And they could sing. Where had these songs been all my life, I wondered. Well, the Beatles were also a challenge for George Martin, who was also a late bloomer to their story. When he first heard them back in February 1962, he could barely stand their demo recordings. In fact, later he would write that he was not knocked out at all. I guess that in 60s speak, not knocked out at all is something like atrocious. In any event, George was not smitten with them, certainly not the way I had been back with my breakfast cereal. No, he had spent the past dozen or so years navigating lowly Parlophone records from the states of financial ruin to the safe harbors of commercial success. And he'd done it on the back of a spate of hit comedy recordings. But what George really wanted to do was develop a beat band of his own. He wanted to develop what he would describe as a fireproof act that he could ride up the charts. For George, it was all a matter of adopting the right formula. In many ways, this aspect of his personality was his greatest personality trait, being methodical, being calculated. But at the same time, it may have also been his great weakness. He had what psychologist Angela Duckworth describes as grit, the idea that through hard work and persistence, we can make the best version of ourselves. The problem was, George had a lot of gritty self-determination, but precious little in the way of Good talent scouting, the kind of passion you need to pick the next fireproof act. Well, I know a thing or two about George's dilemma. For me, the best example of this occurred in college when it came time to select a major. I knew in my heart of hearts what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an English major and study language and literature. But when it came time to make that selection, I was at tenterhooks. No, I, sh I chose business administration instead. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I chose business administration for the simple fact that to my ears, it sounded like it would pay the bills. You see, like George, I had my own formula. It looked something like this. And as you can tell, it was pretty pragmatic and very short-sighted. Formulas like this end up bringing you to a crisis, and it certainly did in my case. I began to notice the disintegration of my own psyche in the face of the fact that one day I would have to argue for a job, go to a job interview, and make a case for myself as a business major. I was petrified at the thought of it. So one day, in a moment of incredible self-determination, I went down to the registrar's office, picked up my file, because remember, this is the 80s, files were still paper. I picked up that file, and I marched down to the English department, and I declared my major. It was, to borrow the words, of author Vladimir Nabokov, a delicious dream feeling. It was as if I were stepping off of the great precipice of my life into an unknown future. Well, for George Martin, that great moment of crisis occurred in the very second recording session he ever held with the Beatles in September 1962. In late summer, George had assigned the four lads with the task of recording a cover version. He had them rehearse a song by Mitch Murray called How Do You Do It? George had personally selected it by walking over to Tin Pan Alley, which was actually a place at the time in London, and selecting this song as their debut single. 
Well, back in Liverpool, the Beatles were not impressed. They thought it was corny, but at this point, they would have done just about anything George Martin wanted. They would have washed his car if necessary. So they rehearsed the corny song, came back to London, and they performed a pretty passable version of it. But their anger got the best of them. And of course, it was John Lennon, as it always was, who confronted George Martin. John stepped up to him and said, look, we'd rather have no contract at all than put that crap out. Well, George was thunderstruck. Who are these guys? But then just as suddenly he said, well, then what have you got? He called their bluff. And they presented a new song, a new Lennon and McCartney original called Please Please Me. Well, George heard it and he said, well, that's slow and dreary. Come on, you need to pick this up. We need a faster tempo. And you know what? Why didn't you rehearse this back in Liverpool before you even came out here? Well, the Beatles felt that sting of his scolding and they felt it deeply. They went back home to Liverpool. They rehearsed the song all week. And when they came back to London, to Abbey Road Studios, they blew George away. They had transformed that lugubrious composition into a high octane pop song. Said these words to my girl. I know you never even try, girl. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, please, 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 oh yeah, I gotta please you. Well, quite suddenly, George was a true convert. They had heard him, they had listened to his advice, and they had come through with their own passion and resolve. They had taken a slow song and made it better. So George did what George knows how to do best. He called a meeting, brought the Beatles together, and he was ready to put his chips on the table in an unthinkable way. He told them that they were gonna make a record album, a full, long-playing record, Nobody but nobody was doing this with beat bands at the time, but George didn't care. He was ready to go. He was now stepping off the precipice of the life of his great unknown future, and he was excited to get started. Now, if you're at a loss for words, that's okay. It's never easy to get out of our own way and let the magic happen. As for me, just changing my major obviously did not end my struggle. I still had a lot to learn, but now I had passion and resolve on my side. Today, I enjoy a lifetime of teaching, writing, speaking, travel, and oh yes, I even managed to pay the bills most of the time. <laughs> and now my path has led to a place where I'm working on George's biography so I can tell his story for successive generations. You know, in his own day, George Martin was just as flummoxed as all of us non-legendary Beatles producer types. But after his experience with Please Please Me, he was able to glimpse beyond the hardwired professional expectations that he had for himself and the band. He was able to get over the fears and uncertainties that plague us all and revel in the pure experience of their music. Sink or swim, George Martin had finally learned to surrender to the creative engine that lived inside himself. And oh, how the Beatles and George Martin would swim. Thank you. <laughs>